So it is um, graduation season, as many of you know. Many of you have attended or at least been invited to some sort of graduation ceremony. And all of you know that graduation ceremonies always include speeches. And those speeches are generally intended to be inspirational and motivational for all those graduates, getting them pumped for life. And that is really nice, right? However, graduation ceremonies would feel much different if the keynote speaker took the time to communicate some of the more negative or harsh realities that we all know to be true about life. If the keynote speaker got up and spoke like this, it would be much different. If they got up and said, graduates, your life is about to get much harder. You're going to feel lonely. You're going to lose sometimes. You're going to struggle to maintain lasting friendships. Your career path is going to be completely different than what you imagine it to be. You're going to have a hard time, sometimes for long periods of time. From this day forward, graduates, hardship and suffering await you. Well, that would be a much different kind of ceremony, wouldn't it? And yet there's a part of us that understands that that would be a realistic presentation for the graduates to understand. And what I want you to begin to see today is that while that would be a horrible graduation commencement address, we do see a parallel between what I just said and the nature of the book of Acts. Luke wrote the book of Acts to chronicle all these things that God did as he founded the church, as God was doing amazing work among these people. And yet, much of what we have seen throughout this book is suffering, hardship, rejection, anger, mobs, beatings, even martyrdom and death. And our question would be, if, if Luke was trying to give an inspirational speech to any Christians that would come after saying, hey, look, this is what God has done. This is what God's continuing to do. It's weird in a way for him to include all of this hardship. In fact, if we were to summarize Luke's message in the book of Acts for any Christians that would read it in any time period that came after, his message would be suffering and hardship await you. And yet it still is an inspirational message for us. How? Well, we'll see today that it is possible from the Christian perspective to face the reality of hardship and suffering with an unstoppable positivity and hope. In fact, in this amazing book of the Bible, we have seen numerous examples of believers who were able to persevere and to grow and even utilize great hardship for the glory of God through Jesus Christ. What we'll see as we continue through Acts 21 into Acts 22 today is this simple truth. And I think that we've stated something similar to this before, but the first blank on your sheet, the kind of theme as we go through things today is this, for Christians, Hardship is certain, but it is also meaningful. My graduation speech for you this morning as believers in Jesus Christ is this. Suffering and hardship await you. But it's also pretty great. As we look forward in life to what may lie ahead of us, we can know that yes, we will suffer. Yes, we will hurt. Yes, we will sometimes feel as if we are being punished for doing the right things. But we do not lose hope. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. One of the most beautiful aspects of our faith in Jesus Christ is that our present hardships have meaning. They have purpose. Suffering in Christ can be redemptive. Our pain can have a purpose. We know that we have a God who loves us deeply who is able to work all things together for our good. Yes, hardship is certain, but it is meaningful and useful and purposeful for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, you'll remember that last week we talked about Paul and his determination to visit Jerusalem. We saw how he was warned by the Christians at Tyre not to go, that he was going to be imprisoned and suffer there. We also saw that the, the prophet named, um, named Agabus in Caesarea also said the same thing. You're going to go to prison. They're going to take you away and beat you and hurt you. Don't go to Jerusalem. This is the message from the Spirit of God to Paul. 
hardship and suffering await you. But as you'll remember from last week, the message to Paul was twofold. It wasn't just that suffering and hardship awaited him. It was also that you must go anyway. So Paul sets forth to Jerusalem. We saw the first part of his time there. But while his friends were trying to convince him not to go, let me remind you of this thing that he said in what we read last week in Acts chapter 21, verse 13. As they begged Paul not to go forward, he said this. What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul's fully aware that hardship awaits him. He knows full well that he will suffer and be put in jail, but he's ready for it. He knows that his hardship is meaningful. He is ready to suffer and even to die. For the name of the Lord Jesus. Now keep those words in mind as we see that suffering come to pass in Acts chapter 21. Let's start with verses 27 to 30. <clears throat> it says, When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled his, this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. Now, if you'll recall from the passage that we read last week, as Paul entered Jerusalem, meeting with the Jewish Christians there, those Jews who had come to faith in Christ, he chose to take James's advice and make a conciliatory gesture, to seek reconciliation with these Jews who had come to Christ by following through with a vow that other Jewish Christians had made. And that involved going into the temple and purifying himself. That meant that people began to notice that Paul was around. And these Jews here that are getting mad with him are not the thousands of Jews who have turned to Christ. These are devoted Jewish people who are holding fast to the importance of the temple and their heritage of faith. And for that reason, they see Paul as a traitor. And Paul, being so successful in sharing the good news of Jesus, well, he was a real threat to their way of life. So they throw some hands. They grab Paul and they stir up the crowd. They claim that he is teaching everyone everywhere to be against the Jews and against the temple. Now, we're also told that they had seen Paul with Greek people in the temple. They basically, they call out this person named Trophimus. We saw that name last week as one of the people who joined Paul on this journey. We don't really know anything else about this character Trophimus. His name comes up three times in the New Testament, kind of in passing. All that we really know about him is that he's a Gentile who had come to Christ probably while Paul was in Ephesus. That's the Asia area that they were talking about. He was a Gentile. He was not of Jewish heritage, and thus he would not be welcomed into the temple. Now, you'll notice, though, in that passage that we just read, it doesn't say that they had specifically seen Paul taking a Greek like Trophimus into the temple. No, it says they supposed that because they had seen Paul with Trophimus a lot, that he probably took Trophimus into the temple. So they don't even have real evidence. Again, they're just angry and mad. And so, for that reason, the whole city is stirred up because they're making up reasons to be upset with Paul. And they dragged Paul out of the, te the temple and they slammed the gates shut behind him. And I want you to imagine for just a moment Paul's total and complete lack of surprise when this happened. How many times last week did we see people tell him that exactly this would take place? The Spirit of God had told Paul, this is what's going to happen. The people, the Christians at Tyre, told him exactly the same thing. Agabus, the prophet, prophesied this to him. The Holy Spirit is telling me, if you go to Jerusalem, the Jews are going to imprison you and drag you away and hurt you, and you will suffer. And Paul said, I know. So you can imagine in this moment, as this mob is starting to gather and they drag him away, Paul is not shocked. 
He does not seem surprised that this is all at, at all. The Spirit of God had warned him over and over again of this, and now it's happening. And as far as we're told here, Paul did not react with any level of shock or even any level of self-defense. I don't think he's confused or even really worried in this situation. It's all happening just as God said that it would. The complete lack of reaction from Paul shows us this. The first blank or the next blank on your sheet is this. Hardship gives us the opportunity to demonstrate trust. Even though Paul knew this was coming, even though he had been warned of this, surely we can understand that this is distressing. There is no doubt in my mind that Paul isn't enjoying this. It's painful. Nobody wants to be dragged away by an angry mob. And yet, there seems to be this quiet comfort in Paul as he trusts in the Lord and his word. Paul isn't resigned to this, but rather resolved by it. Even this horrible thing that is happening is a reminder to him of God's sovereign power and control. Paul may not like what's happening to him here, but it doesn't shake his faith. In fact, it's a reassurance. It confirms that the God who has spoken to him has told the truth. God, in his kindness, has given us his word. He has revealed himself to us. He has spoken to us. And his word is very real with us about the idea of suffering in this world. In fact, the Bible very clearly presents suffering as a certainty for us. Not only will we suffer because of the consequences of our own sins. We do things that are wrong and we suffer those consequences. Sin causes us to suffer. Our sin causes us to suffer. But secondly, we also suffer because of the sins of other people. Other people, like in Paul's situation, wrong us. They do wrong things that have consequences that we suffer. And thirdly, the whole world, the very nature of creation is broken by sin. We have diseases and natural disasters and birth defects and all sorts of terrible things that cause us to suffer. All of them are caused by the root of sin. And we know that we'll suffer. God's word has made this clear for us. And even though we know that this suffering is coming, we still have faith in God who is working through those things a redemptive plan. So in a very real way, we should understand the suffering that we endure to be an affirmation of the word spoken by God. He told us it would be this way. In fact, Jesus himself went as far to say this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 to 12. <clears throat> he said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we endure hardship, especially when we suffer because of our allegiance to Jesus Christ, what is his word to us? Rejoice and be glad. Persecution, suffering, hardship, those things are coming. I have told you so, but your reward is great in heaven. So what I want you to see is this. We can understand the suffering we endure as an affirmation of who God is to us. We have a God who has loved us enough to tell us in his word that these things are going to happen. And when they take place, instead of saying, how could you, God? I'm angry at you, God. Instead, a mature believer can say, God, you told me this was how it's going to be. You told me that I was going to suffer in these ways. And you told me that I can rejoice through these things because there's a greater redemption, there's a greater reward that is coming for me. This is exactly what my God told me to expect. Imagine developing the kind of trust in the Lord that helps you to endure suffering because you see suffering as an affirmation of the truthfulness and care that God has towards you. When we go through hardship, we can be led to greater trust in the Lord, not only because he told us it was coming, but also because we know and believe that he is able to accomplish something through it. That's why Paul isn't freaking out in this moment. 
He knew this was coming. He doesn't know how it's going to end, but he trusts in the Lord anyway. Look back at Acts chapter 21 with me in verses 31 to 36. <clears throat> it says, and as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. And he at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, <clears throat> he ordered him to be brought back into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of, mob of people followed, crying out, away with him. Now, this should sound pretty familiar, right? There are clearly ties between what we see happening here in Jerusalem and what we saw just a couple chapters ago in Ephesus. Both of these angry mobs are operating on false claims. Both of them are fueled by rage over the truth, and they're operating from a place of general confusion. Both cause an uproar in which people are just shouting things over one another, and nobody even knows why they're so upset. <clears throat> However, you'll remember that the mob at Ephesus was comprised of Gentiles, people who were not Jewish, people who were pagans, right? And this crowd in Jerusalem is made up completely of devout Jews. Now, either way, it is a frantic mess, and they are actually, as it said, trying to kill Paul. And we know also from our experience before in the book of Acts that the gov governing authorities of Rome do not like it when this sort of thing happens. So... They get word of all this chaos, and they send in the authorities. Now, the tribune that's mentioned here, he will continue to be a prominent character for the next couple of chapters of the book of Acts. We're told later on that his name is actually Claudius Lysias. And being a tribune means that he is in charge of 1,000 men. 100, or sorry, 10 centurions who are in charge of 100 men each answer to this tribune. And when he hears of this, he rushes in with multiple centurions and probably what are hundreds of armed guards. The guys in the full armor and swords and shields and all those sorts of things, they rush in to stop this. So needless to say, this is a major disruption in Jerusalem. However, because Lysias can't make sense of what's going on, he can't hear who Paul is, he takes Paul instead to the barracks there for questioning. Look back, back at Acts chapter 21, verses 37 to 39. It says, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? And Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, I want you to notice the stark contrast here. On the one hand, there's this wild, angry mob taking the law into their own hands, about to execute a person outside the law, shouting and causing an uproar, confused and yelling different things, so much so that the tribune can't even figure out what is happening. And then there's Paul, dirty and beaten, probably with blood dripping from his face from the beatings and Paul is engaging in calm polite conversation with Lysias there are two sides to every story sure but this difference is significant and that is a fact that is almost certainly not lost on this tribune named Lysias in this chaos Paul is demonstrating more than just trust Paul is showing us this next thing, the next blank on your sheet is this, that even in the midst of hardships, we can have peace. This is difficult for us to cultivate, but it is possible for Christians to face all kinds of the worst things in life, all of the worst things that the, the world has to offer, and somehow still have supernatural peace. In all of life's storms, we have this sure and steady anchor in Christ, this knowledge that even if our lives here end, we are safe in the palm of his hand. 
we don't always know if things on earth are going to turn out the way that we want. Very often, they don't. But we can have peace which surpasses all understanding because we have a strong and trustworthy Savior in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to imagine for me just a second. When Paul was in the midst of this angry mob beating him and trying to kill him, surrounded by the chaos and the yelling and the anger, and while you hold that vision in your mind, listen also to what Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2 tells us. For Christians, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Even while he was being attacked and surrounded by an angry mob, Paul's eyes were on something different. Yes, he was surrounded by violent people. But in that same moment, Paul understood he was also surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, this deep heritage of faith, this long-lasting evidence of the work of God, not only in his life, but in the lives of so many other people. In that moment, even surrounded by violence, he was surrounded by even more faith because of what had been done in his life and what God has continued to do since then. Paul was able to look to Jesus and endure because of what he knows Jesus has done. We can look to Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, as that passage just told us. The Jesus, who was sitting on the throne then, when Paul was taken and beaten by the crowd, that Jesus is still sitting on the throne. Paul's Savior is my Savior. Paul's Savior is your Savior. And we can look to him because we know that we have peace with the one who is seated on the throne. Now, in this moment, Paul, speaking to Lysias, the tribune, calmly clears up some confusion. As we just read, Lysias has no idea who Paul even was. In fact, he confuses him with some Egyptian guy who had led an uprising with some assassins or something strange like that. And Paul explains, whoa, 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 I'm not an Egyptian assassin. I'm just some Jew from Tarsus. I'm a well-educated man from a, a nice city. And for that reason, may I speak to my people? And Lysias, perhaps impressed with Paul's calmness and confidence, allows him to speak to the people. Look at Acts chapter 21, verses 40 through 22, verse 5. <clears throat> it says, And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are to this day. I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. So Paul, having been given permission, takes this opportunity not only to show that he is fluent in multiple languages, but also to share the gospel. We'll see this more clearly as he continues on in his speech, but this is exactly what he's doing. He has the attention of this angry mob of people. They're listening to him for just a second. They want to kill him, but they're going to hear what he has to say. So he takes this moment to share his personal testimony with them. This is one more thing that we see reflected in this story. And this is hard for us to digest, but we'll, we'll think about it as we go through the rest of the passage. Hardships remind us of the hope of the gospel. Hardships remind us of the hope of the gospel. Again, when we suffer these things, 
we know that we have a sovereign God who cares for us, who told us that we would suffer in this world. We have peace because our salvation is secure. And the very existence of hardships, the hardships that we face, remind us of what has been accomplished for us by Jesus. Paul says in this moment, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I make before you. But the defense that Paul makes is no defense at all. He doesn't defend his innocence. He doesn't appeal to the law or to his citizenship or, or to what should or should not be done according to those things. No, instead, his only defense is what Jesus has done for him. That is as if to say, you can do whatever you want to me. This is where my security lies. This is my defense before you, that I have a Savior who has saved me eternally and forever. So instead, Paul just tells his own story, chronicling his own heritage in his encounter with Jesus. And in that explanation, Paul explains, first of all, that he is just like them. He is a Jew from birth, educated under a priest named Gamaliel, zealous for the law and for God, as he said. Paul also explains that he, was, he persecuted the way. He persecuted this Christian movement from the very start. He sent people to prison because of their faith in Jesus Christ. There are literally people in this angry mob of Jews that knew Paul before, that had been involved in sending him to Damascus to go and collect more Jews that had followed Christ and bring them back to Jerusalem to be thrown in prison. They had been there. They had personal experience with the Paul who was before. In other words, while Paul has been wronged and harmed by these people, instead of reacting with anger or spite, Paul's mind rests in the gospel. Why? Because he sees the truth about himself and his own sin and his need for a savior reflected in these people. Paul is saying to them, I was just like you. The sin that is leading you in anger to desire to kill me, I was there. I had that for other people, for other Christians. I was doing that to others. That sin that I feel the consequences of against me right now, I know that I share in that sin. Now imagine for just a moment. Having the kind of mindset when people beat you and just tried to kill you, that you're able to look to them and see yourself in your own sin. For you personally, take a moment to think of the people in your life who have wronged you the most, who have hurt you the most. In Christian maturity, we should be able to see them for the sinners that they are. Now, I'm not saying that it's, it's not right for you to be angry with them. Sometimes it's right for us to have righteous anger towards sin in this world. We, we shouldn't like it. But when it comes even to the people who have hurt you the most, do you have the kind of Christian maturity that you can look at them and think to yourself, the sin that's in their heart that has led them to treat me in this way, that's the same sin that I have. I, without Christ, am just like that. Your greatest enemy, the person who has hurt you the most, you are just like them if it weren't for Christ. This is the hard truth. It's a hard thing for us to do because we get so wrapped up in our emotions and our own hurt and that sort of thing. But I want you to understand this. Without the work of Jesus Christ changing your heart, changing your desires, leading you on a new path, your sin is the same. There is no sin in this world of which you are not capable. You could fall into any of it. And as Christians, one of the things that we return to most often is the reality of our own sin and our need for salvation. So even when people are wronging us, even when we are hurt by other people, we should be able to step back and say, whatever they're doing to me, as much as it hurts me, I at least know where it comes from because I have that same sin. The sin that has infected them, that is hurting me, is what Jesus has saved me from. That's how hardship and suffering can remind us of the gospel. That's why Paul is saying this here to them. He's saying, I was just like you. 
he is telling them very clearly. He's saying, I know that you're wrong, and I know that most of all because I was you. Their sin and their violence and their anger towards Paul fully reminds him of the gospel because it reminds him of his own slavery to sin. Paul is saying, I was one of you, I was lost, I was angry, I was desperate, and I was broken. And even in the midst of some serious hardship, Paul sees the truth that all this suffering and hardship comes from sin, the kind of sin that he has been rescued from. His speech continues in verses 6 through 11. He says, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light fell or from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Here, Paul explains to his audience how he personally encountered Jesus. Now, we know and understand the story well. Paul's description here pretty much exactly mirrors what we read and studied back in Acts chapter 9. In a life-changing moment, Jesus himself personally appears to Paul, stopping him on the road to Damascus, and changed everything for him. Paul, the chief persecutor of the church, the one who took such joy in causing Christians to suffer, is changed in an instant. Yes, before, he was just like the people to whom he is speaking. But then, Jesus came and changed everything. And again, in this moment of hardship, Paul is reminded of the hope of the gospel. If Paul could have his life changed by Jesus Christ, then surely Jesus is able to do that same work in the people to whom Paul is speaking. So how can you be reminded of the hope of the gospel in times of hardship? Well, you can be reminded of how much Jesus has changed your life and if he did it for you, then we know that he'll be faithful to sustain you through it, and also that he's able to work in the hearts of the people who are wronging you in the same way. As Paul is suffering under the hands of these people, his mind is right back on the gospel. This is how Jesus changed my life. And if he did this for me, then it's possible for him to do it for you as well. He goes on saying this in verses 12 to 16. He says, in one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now, we don't have to dwell on every detail that was just shared there. It is exactly what we studied back in Acts chapter 9. Paul was blinded by God, but God spoke to Ananias, who had been afraid to approach the dreaded Paul before. But Ananias faithfully and obediently cared for Paul. God restored his sight, and then he is set on a new path of work for the Holy Spirit. And again, this whole situation of being dragged away and beaten, by a, um, beaten up by a mob reminds Paul of the hope of the gospel. He was saved for a reason. He was saved, as it said, to be a witness. This is his new purpose. He is set forth on a path where his job is to tell people about what he has seen and heard about how the Lord Jesus Christ has absolutely changed his life. And we also can be reminded this morning that even in times of hardship, our gospel purpose remains. You, like Paul, were saved to be a witness. 
Not just when things are going well, but even in the times when you are suffering. Even in moments of hardship, your purpose remains. You will be his witnesses. Finally, let's wrap up this section in Paul's speech in Acts chapter 22, verses 17 to 21. He says, when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. He said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Here Paul informs this angry mob of Jews that way back when Jesus changed his life, which was about 25 years before this moment, God warned Paul that the Jews in Jerusalem would not accept his testimony. Paul even references here in his speech to him his own participation in the stoning of Stephen as they killed him. And he says all this as if to say, yes, Lord, I know what they are capable of. I was there. I was with them. And instead, at that time, God chose to send Paul to the Gentiles, to people who were far from God and further disconnected from the Jews and the temple. And that is exactly, that is exactly what Paul has been doing to great effect. For decades, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world with great success. And now, as the gospel prevails all over the world, it has brought Paul back to Jerusalem, a place where he knew they would not accept his testimony. And guess what? We'll continue to see next week that circumstances have not changed, that the fate that he knew was coming still awaits him. And even in this hardship, Paul remembers not only his specific calling, but also all that the gospel has done. He may feel in this moment as if he is losing. This situation, it's bad. And yet the gospel is still good. He has seen so many Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. So how could a little hardship like this stop him from continuing on? As Paul expressed in our opening scripture passage that we read this morning, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, he says this. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, <clears throat> because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. We have a great and enduring gospel hope. Hardships are certain, but God is able to use them to produce something in us. We can trust that even through hardship, we can endure and develop character. We can have peace. We can grow in hope, as the passage said. Suffering and hardship can actually bring to mind for us the hope of the gospel. In hardship, we see clearly the brutal and painful consequences of sin in the world. Sin that we share. Sin that we were saved from by Jesus Christ. In hardship, we see the redemptive power of Jesus. Not just for us, but for the world. And even in the midst of suffering, our purpose remains. We must live in good times and bad as witnesses to all that we have seen and heard from Jesus Christ. There's no way around it. Your life will include suffering. You will, to one degree or another, endure persecution because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But do not let that stop you. Your hardship has meaning. It has purpose. So live in that purpose for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray as we close for today. Lord Jesus, we pray that we can be people that can display the kind of trust that Paul did in that moment of hardship. We pray that you'll help us to be people that are so preoccupied with the gospel of Jesus that it comes to mind even in those hardest moments. 
God, we pray that you'll give us supernatural peace when we feel emotionally distracted because of all the things that we suffer and hurt from in this world. And in those moments, instead of crying out as if we can yell against the world, cause things to be better by being upset, God, instead, no, help us to trust in who you are, to have peace in what you have done, and to rem remember the goodness of the gospel. Even in moments of hardship and pain, I pray that you will help us to be people who can say with full confidence that it is well with my soul. Be with us as we worship. Help us to live as we are called. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.